For the past week, Walter Cronkite has presented a series of special reports from the sites where Apollo 11 has been planned and previewed. Tonight's report from an unlikely place called Goldstone, a vital communication center for the mission. Time runs by fits and starts here in the California desert. Centuries go by with hardly a change, and then in a night, a hundred years vanish. Time, human time, that is, began here, oh, about 50,000 years ago, when men first trudged across that land bridge from Asia up north there and came down here to find a green and lush valley, abundant in game, the bighorn sheep, the giant ground sloth. But slowly, century by century, something happened. The weather changed. The Mojave grew hotter, drier, hotter still. The food animals left, and then most of the people. And after that, very little happened for thousands of years. And suddenly, over the mountains, the white man appeared to save the Indian, or slaughter him, or both. Prospectors spread out through the great desert. Most of them left poorer than they came. Many of them died and stayed. A very few grew very rich. Not around here, though. Uh, they called it Goldstone. And the name was about half right. The prospectors who dug here found a, found a lot of stone, but precious little gold. Oh, a couple of the workings were worth digging in. But Goldstone never had a glory hole like Yellow Aster there to the west. A few shanties, miserable and squalid when they were new, picturesque now, are all that remain as a monument to the gold rush here. On this side of the hill, time has stopped again in the 19th century. Over there, on the other side, it has jumped ahead to the 21st. Amid Joshua trees and cactus, strange new growths spring up. These are the machines that listen to the spaceships, half a dozen enormous antennas, including this one, the biggest of all, its construction seen here in time-lapse photography. This is Mars Station, 210 feet across, heavy as a warship on swivels. At the three corners of the Earth, in Spain, Australia, and California, these vast receivers squat in the barrens, listening to the mariner probes on the way to Mars to the pioneer ships orbiting the sun, and waiting now for the tiny, tiny signals that will be Apollo 11's television pictures and telemetry from the moon. But in human terms, these immense receivers are among the most demanding assignments of the space age. They must operate in the wilderness, far from civilization with its electronic jabber that would overwhelm those whispers from other worlds. I asked Dick Kephart at the Manned Space Flight Network's 85-foot Apollo antenna about the problems of a career in the heart of the desert. Are you fellows sort of like uh, many sorts of adventurers, Arctic explorers and so forth, who kind of uh, relish the hardship of your post? I think we do. I, I think it's, uh, it's part of the job. I think it's part of the uh, will to make you go and stay in these areas. Do you get young men who come into this program who can't take the isolation? Oh, I think a young single, single man in the desert finds a little bit, uh, a little bit of a hardship, but uh, very few. I think most of our people are so engrossed in the program, their, their environment is secondary. Here in the California desert, we ended this week-long, 3,000-mile-wide look at America's space program on the eve of the moon landing. It's a good place to finish and to pause and think because the Mojave offers a mixed perspective of time and the timeless, of 50,000 years of human history about to turn an irrevocable corner right now, in our own time, this week, with a step on to another world. And that suggests the question that has always been the most challenging to the human race. What next? Will time again stop on this reverse slope of the Mojave Desert and on this planet? Will mankind, will we, having made this first great stride between worlds, 
retreat again, as the Indians did, as the Spaniards did, as the 49ers did, surrendering this alien and hostile new desert in the moment of winning it? Or will this generation, which has lurched forward so swiftly and so disjointedly toward a new century and a new world, continue to race on, fast and far, farther even than the great Mars station can hear, on and out, past the moon, beyond the planets, to the blazing and glorious universe beyond.